think that I deserve this. Do you? He thinks about it. What does he do? Changes it again. All right. Anybody know when that film was made? Eighty-four. Every principle you saw in that attack is still in use today, almost verbatim. I know where to write the password down. I know the phone number to dial. I was just curious. She leaves the room, he changes it anyways. Because he has this sense of privacy that nobody knows what he's doing. Right? When you think about the typical attack cycle for a pen tester, a hacker, a defense coordinator, whatever you want to call it, it really breaks down to these simple actions, right? You're going to enumerate the target. Do not get wrapped around enumeration as just a port scan. I'll talk about that in a minute. They're going to find out something about the target. They're going to exploit it. They're going to escalate whatever it is they've gotten a hold of, and they're going to execute action, and they're going to steal all your cat picks. I mean, that's what's going to happen, right? Where Tor comes in with this is that it's the enumeration piece, the act of finding information about a potential target. It's not just a port scan. If somebody is targeting a service, why are they targeting it? Right? That's where you have to start off at. Read that again. It's not just a port scan. Enumeration is almost always never just a port scan. Where Tor comes in, you have to be able to defeat enumeration. And it gets down to this weird set of words I have up here. Can anybody figure out what the connection is with all these words? You got a brick wall and you got fog. What do they do? Stop the state. Stop visible light, right? Which one can you hit with a hammer? Which one is stationary? Which one can you control? Right. Go to the second one. You don't want anybody to talk about what it is you're working on. Do you demand silence out of them? Or do you allow them to talk in a room where it's noisy where people can't hear them? Which one's more reasonable? The latter. The latter, right? Last one. Everybody knows what an NDA is, right? You've worked on some project, they make you sign an NDA saying, don't ever talk about this, right? Okay. How about just don't tell them about it in the first place? Silo that information. Right? Enumeration is based on understanding what you're actually protecting and why. If I can enumerate your network because I understand better what it is you have than you do, that's your problem. When somebody's enumerating your stuff, okay? You have to identify the risks in your networks and apply basic principles to them to protect them. And this is where Tor comes in. Tor is not meant to protect a client-based website. It's not realistic because you're already violating the knowledge piece of that when you think about it. Everybody has knowledge of where the address is, right? Tor gives you these crazy onion addresses that are hard to find. You can't just go into a search engine to find it. You'd have to go into the hidden descriptors on the Tor database and pull all that information out and then ascertain when 
I fired up my server and correlate that. Okay, that's nation state level. You're not going to have the kid off the street doing that with script and stuff. Okay, that's why I have, I'm telling you, you have to understand what it is you're actually protecting and why. You determine where the resource is. In this instance, I'm using Tor specifically for administrating networks and devices that I want limited access to. If the device is scanned, I want to drop off the network. When you think about security, where are the basic principles of security? CIA. Who is for CIA for? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability, right? The one I'm really going after is confidentiality. The integrity piece I'll take care of through, through use of SSH and security, or through certs. Availability, you have to get rid of one of those three to have a really secure system. You have to get rid of two of those three if you want it to be a real pain. In this particular instance, I am more concerned about the confidentiality of the service than I am about the availability of that service at all. Right? Because when you're administering a network, if the admin portion of your network goes down, Right, for you to remotely access into something is as big a concern as the front end database for the customers going down. Which one causes more headache in the long run? One affects a thousand customers or two your admins. Right? See, that's where you have to approach the problem set. <clears throat> when you think about Tor hidden services, they provide a level of security through obscurity. Obscurity is not security. It is simply something that adds on security, okay? Not knowing about something doesn't make it secure. It just makes it hard to find. And when we think about that first step of enumeration, if you work for a company and somebody is targeting your company in order to gain access in the admin side of it, a couple of first things they can do is they can look up against local telcos, they can look in the Canada database and see what IP address spaces your company is sitting in. And maybe you don't publish half of that subset that you're using, right? But if you've ever worked for a telco, you know that they typically sell them in blocks. You can go through and figure out what IP addresses actually belong to that telco. That goes into fingerprinting. It goes into dumpster diving. It goes to looking at that company, pulling their mail, and seeing who they're actually getting bills from. If you do those things, you can narrow down the IP space that the company is working out of. Okay? This goes into narrowing your target set. This is the way almost every hack starts. They have to get to you virtually. If they don't have a virtual route to get to you, they have to do a Kano operation, they have to get a close, ac close access network operation going on. Not gonna happen for a typical company. Okay, when I say that, that means that somebody comes in and they put a bridging device in your area, right? Not what a script key is gonna typically do, you know? And when I think of a bridging device, there's plenty of public ones out there, you think of a pineapple, right? A pineapple can be used as a bridging device. You drop one off in a Starbucks, you SSH into it. You may need to want to define what pineapple is for. Right, you know, so a pineapple is a open source router that basically enables somebody to SSH into that device. It has multiple Wi-Fi cards. And they can scan and they can look at the traffic that's currently available on that network and determine whether or not they want to do something with it, okay? Those types of devices <clears throat> will work against Tor in the regard that they know where you are at physically. If you don't tell anybody where you put your server, if you put on AWS Cloud, and you host Tor services on it, it makes it much more difficult for somebody to get physical access to that device. Because you yourself don't know where that device is at. Everybody good with that? Defense in depth. Yes, that is seriously a thing. That means you have to add layers on for defense to work. And that's where this talk's gonna kind of talk about today. With Linux, it's those two commands to install Tor for CentOS 7. You set up the, the uh, evil release one, you uninstall Tor, that's it. That is seriously it. That is all you have to do to get Tor on that box. I'm not talking about Tor browser, I'm talking about the Tor service, okay? There is a distinction between the two. Tor in itself provides what's called a SOX proxy. Has anybody heard of a SOX proxy? Okay, so a SOX proxy basically allows applications to tunnel through it if they're TCP based. So it sets up a local listener on that device and says, hey, if you want to push proxy traffic to me, simply direct all your traffic for that application to port whatever locally. 
and then this application will handle that traffic for you and push it through whatever protocol stack it has to get to the other side. That's really what we're going after today is that SOX proxy that's available on the Tor. I have a question about the Tor package that where, where it fits in, that you're installing. Is that, that doesn't make your machine a node, does that just allows you as a client to get into well, the Tor network? Client. That's a question, and which, which right. of that does it do? Right, so in order for you to be a node, you actually have to do this next step. Uh, okay, that was services. Okay. Can't see that well on here, but basically this is a cutout of what's actually configured in that. And if you go to that file down there, that, uh, the Tor, Tor RC file, and actually edit that file out, you can actually at that point enable those services on your machine, right? And then once you do that, you create that hidden directory, you'll have to restart the Tor services, and what's going to happen is it's going to generate something called a private key for you. And I'll kind of walk through all that when we actually go through setting up Tor from the get-go. Once that is done and that service is running, it's going to have a .onion address associated to it. Now hopefully you can see it a little better here. This is the part that kind of stands out. In this file, it's always in the format of target port that you're going to on tour, 80. Where you're going to locally to the box, okay? Do you notice this is an IP address, right? With tour, you don't have to direct it to the local host. If you want to use that tour node as a relay because you don't trust the tour node to host the service you're trying to get to, you put this in a DMZ, that tour node, and you point it at a firewall you do port forwarding on the firewall to your real SSH server. Does that make sense? So what you do is you have this Tor node outside of your real network, but sitting in your DMZ where it's still untrusted. You don't believe that that Tor node is secure. That's fine. You then, instead of pointing it at 127.0.1, you point it at your firewall. We'll say that's 192.168.1.1. And you point it at a specific port at that, on that firewall. You then port forward through your firewall to your real SSH server. That again segregates the Tor node. If the Tor node is compromised, they still have to deal with the firewall at least to get through that. Now, if we can go one further. Does everybody see that weird loopback address I have there? Let me go back one. You may need to read it with the type being so small, just for those sitting in the back. Everybody see this dot two loopback address? Is everybody familiar with the, the idea that you can have multiple loopbacks on a Linux box? Actually, I did. So no, that, I wasn't aware of that. So one twenty seven dot one is usually local host or home. Right. What is uh, so? What's dot two? Whatever you want to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. One twenty seven dot anything basically to play. I tried pinging one twenty seven. You know. Anytime you two use two by four. You know. If, right. Anytime yeah, you use anything in that whole. That I whole range can be used. Yes. The whole, what is that, class Points. A or something like that? Like, yeah. So everything after 127? Or you can one? use. Yep. Okay, wow. It goes local. So it's you. It's you. think about this in context. How many of you guys have heard of fail the band? Okay. What's fail? How is, can somebody explain how fail the band works? The outside person attempts to connect to your SSH server and, and fails to connect more than the, the number of times you specify in the config normally three. Right, but that's weird. They don't have an IP address in Tor, do they? But your service does. Silo the service. If you know that that address is tied to that IP address, right, the whole idea behind Tor is you don't want anybody logging in other than you. Three fail attempts, you know that the address is compromised. Ban it. But you don't want to ban dot one, because what happens when you ban dot one on a Linux box? Bad stuff, right? Typically, things stop working. Dot two, Linux doesn't rely on dot two at all. Or dot three or dot whatever. So what you do is you isolate your onion address to a loopback that you don't care about. And you've got that whole address space to, as fail to ban, can lock out one after another right. after another. And what you do yeah. to get fail ban to do this, fail to ban has a in their config file, they have it as a slash 8 for the 127 address. Change that to a slash 32 for 127.0.0.1. That way your dot one stays safe. But everything else in that address space then becomes untrusted loopbacks. 
right? And the way you create an untrusted loopback on Linux, it's interface up, L0 colon, number, IP address. You can create as many as you need. On a typical Tor server, you can only have 16 hidden services running at a time with 16 separate addresses. So you use that how you're going to use that. So this is where it comes in. So with fail the ban in particular, you can write an action script, and this goes into the Python stuff. If you understand how Tor is set up, you can write a Python script to examine the fail the ban log or execute on that fail the ban log. And basically what it would do is it would erase the private key out of this directory. Okay. Once that private key is erased and Tor is restarted, a new private key is generated with a different address. What have you done in the enumeration cycle for that attacker? Turn back to square one, basically. They don't even know where you're at anymore. And since you're writing the Python script and you control it, you can run multiple Tor nodes. What's to prevent you from catting that file to a web page or to an SMS message like you got your last year of Red Hat? And then send that to your phone. The whole idea with, with defeating the enumeration cycle, it boils down to a couple things. There's some things you can control, there's some things you can't. I cannot control the type of attack you're going to do against me. I can only control where I'm standing. Right? So in order to defeat the enumeration cycle, you're not going to defeat a scan that's successful. That's not going to happen. What you're going to do is you're going to try and change where you're at in the IP space from what they perceive. Right? Because once you do that, they then have to go through the whole targeting cycle again and figure out where you're at. That means they maybe they have to come back to your facility, log into a machine, or do some other act in order to get physical access to that onion address, right? So the key is you're, you're like closing the door on one IP and opening a new one and then through a back channel telling yourself what the new one is. Exactly. Right. So that back channel can be any method that you trust. Right. Right. Now, anytime you do that, you add weird methods in, you have to make sure they're secure. Right. Right. But that is the idea. Essentially, you're changing that door every time you see an attack in there because the way I've identified this is, this is a sensitive service, SSH. This should not have port scans in it. So for a web page. Web page is constantly going to get hit. Right? So think about the type of service that you're trying to implement this against. That's why it's service specific. Does that make sense for everybody? In order to get SSH to connect into it, it has to know where your SOX proxy is, right? So when you set up the Tor service, or even if you run a Tor browser on a Linux machine, it's always going to fire off a SOX proxy without you really knowing about it. Does anybody have a Linux box up and running right now with a Tor browser on it right now? Can somebody go to the... I've got the Tor browser. You do? Okay. Uh, no, not, I mean, I have it installed. I haven't... Uh... Okay. What I'd like you to do, Mark, is go ahead and fire up your Tor browser and then run a netstat-natp. And you should see a port listening on 9050 and 9051. Okay. Anytime you fire up that Tor browser, it's automatically going to fire up a SOX proxy for you on 9050. That's actually how the Tor browser gets its traffic out. It's not doing anything special as the browser itself. The browser is basically stripped of all the scripting features, so you're not leaking metadata. And then it relays itself through that 9050 proxy. By adding this statement in into your uh, .ssh config file on your, your Linux home directory, you then can take advantage of using that SOX proxy for SSH. Okay. Yes, Netstat dash NATP. Okay. I'm up. Yeah, yeah. command line. What are the, what are the, uh, if you do it on, even on a Windows machine, uh, just do a netstat. What are the option switches again? Uh, NAT key. Dash NATP. Okay. Okay. Do you have your Tor browser running? Yes. Okay. Is that 9151? Yes. Okay. That's your socks. So you got 9150 right here? Yeah. Okay. That's the listener. So, so this you, is the rolling through that you're talking about. The, the, um, what happens is when you fire up that Tor browser, you're automatically starting up a SOX proxy. That's really what you're doing. It's still uh, 
of 127.0.0.1 on these. Absolutely. Because that proxy is local to your host. So basically what happens is, is that your browser, that Tor browser, is specially configured with a proxy setting to point to 127.0.0.1.9150. So you can use any browser you want to use with Tor. You don't have to use the one they want to use. If you don't really care about being identified and you just want to use Tor, you can point your Internet Explorer, your Chrome, whatever, at that proxy at 9150 and you will be traversing the Tor network at that point. Don't get caught up around the axle that it's some sort of magic sauce. The same thing goes for any other service that's TCP based. If you can get that service to dump its traffic into the proxy, you can do that. In this particular instance, I'm using SoCat. SoCat is a port forwarding tool for Linux, uh, very similar to NC or NetCat. I grew up on SoCat, it's kind of where I live at. So in this particular instance, in the SSH config, I'm basically saying, hey, any onion address, proxy command, execute SoCat and build me a pipe where I take all that traffic and I pipe it through that proxy instead of going the other route. So what happens is SSH then goes, okay, it's an onion address. I'm going to proxy through. I'm going to dump all my traffic. And basically what this does is it allows your SSH server to resolve that onion addresses. This will work on a rooted phone only. Rooted phones allow you to have a SOX proxy, at least on the Android side. If the phone is not rooted, the only phones I've seen work with this is like a Samsung S5. So what you can do is if you want to have access from your phone, the phone would need to be rooted for this to happen, or you'd at least have to have the ability to change some proxy settings. Now I see a lot of the blank stares like, what, this is a lot of crap. It is. And we'll get into the mechanics of it in a minute when we actually run through setting one up. No, no, I am just saying you're right. I'm looking, if I change that line in this config file, to some other port besides 9050, then my next step would show different here, right? No, so, so what no? would happen is, this line is specifically for your SSH service. Your SSH right, service SSH config, yeah. is basically saying, if I get a dot onion address, push the traffic via SOCAT to 9050. That's what I'm saying. If, if I change that line in, in that config file to something else like... Uh, this is not the listener, this is the pusher. This line pushes mm -hmm. your SSH traffic to 9050. But then if I did a next app, whatever I changed that to, my next app would show that. No? Well, not. Really? Because, because the Tor service is setting up the 9050 as the listener. You have to change you it on the Tor side. Two places. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is that an SSH D config or an SSH? Like Just SSH. Like, like you go into your, your, your home folder up. and you do dot SSH. Mm -hmm. And you see that little config line there? That's that, where that goes. That, that's not the SSHD config. That's not the ser a server on your machine. That's your SSH client. Correct. We're talking about. Correct. Yeah. Sorry if I misspoke in that. Regard. No, you didn't. We were just. It just came I up. Just trying to like. Put the piece no, no. It's good to clarify. It's good then to bring it up. Yeah. It's a lot to look at right now, but as yeah. we get to this, I'm actually going to jump on this Raspberry Pi. You guys will see me kind of buzz through the basic config, and then what we'll do is I'll bring up a VM, and I'll actually configure it to host SSH and stuff, and we'll go through that too. There is a lot of components to this. Um, this one's probably going to be even more confusing for some of you. This is what I am doing in the long run. Okay, so I've got Tor running. Okay, over Tor I establish an SSH tunnel. We need some alphabet soup help here. General route encapsulation. So, what you're looking at here is is you're looking at piping three services on top of each other through a network that wasn't designed for it. But it works. The reason this works is Tor only accepts TCP traffic. Anybody ever understand what TCP traffic is versus UDP? UDP is cool video, voice, stuff like that. It's connectionless traffic. Connectionless traffic does not work with SOX proxies. SSH is a TCP based traffic. SSH allows you to do port forwarding. SOCAT allows me to build a GRE tunnel over any ports that I have for it. So I cheat. I build a TCP tunnel over Tor, and then I build a GRE tunnel over the TCP tunnel. It's all contained in the uh, payload of those um, right. packets. 
So what this allows you to do is you can take a Tor node that you don't physically know where it's at and bridge it to on IP side internally and have complete layer 3 access to that entire network. That might not seem relevant. It might, why would I ever want to do this? If you're administrating a network, how many times have you just sat in one box versus hitting like five different servers in a session? Or maybe you're not a command line guy like me. Maybe you want to have BNC up and running. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you want to connect via RDP, right? All that happens over GRE. Maybe you want to join the multicast phone call that I've set up. All that happens over GRE. So GRE lets you get back EDP traffic? GRE, you're setting up an IP address on each side. So if the client side is 10.0.0.1 and the server side is 10.0.0.2 and I ping it, mm -hmm. it'll ping straight through. The entire Tor SSH and GRP is transparent. It does not know. The applications don't care. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, I'm going to go to dot two. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? And this is how you get around the weird exit node problem on Tor. Tor, you know where the exit nodes are at. Everybody knows where the exit nodes are at. They don't know where the exit nodes are at that you build, though. So what you do is you build this pipe on a Raspberry Pi or some other device, right? I then connect to my Raspberry Pi with my laptop. My Raspberry Pi has to maintain the gateway to the internet to keep this Tor tunnel up. My laptop doesn't. You're building your own private exit node that only you use. Correct. Right here in this case. It's exactly what you're doing. And by building this exit node, you can have access into your own networks or the internet. Because the idea is that I own the private node. I don't care if the private node knows who I am because I'm the guy that built it. I'm more concerned about that first mile of traffic where I've got the telco that's snoopy. I maybe I'm someplace where they don't allow journalistic freedom. I don't know. Take your pick, right? Basically, the way we're treating this is we're looking at. We'll get this next slide, actually. How do you keep your private uh, node from being broadcast, announced to the rest of the Tor world for somebody else to think, oh, I want to use this too? Well, that goes into two things, right? It's obscurity, for one. Yeah. And there's another advanced feature where you can actually create client certs and server certs between Tor nodes. If you do that, that's outside the scope of this discussion. Nobody without that client cert can connect that private node that you own. So therefore, it can't announce. It. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a feature coming out in the next month or so where they're actually going one further, where they're going to remove the onion addresses from the hidden descriptors inside of Tor. So that thing is like blatantly in the black hole. Like nobody knows about it unless it's you. If you don't tell Matt where it's at, Matt's never going to find it. Right. And where this stuff kind of comes in handy is when you start thinking about systems that you need to have access to but you don't want necessarily people knowing where your SSH server is sitting at because you have to access it to administer it, right? Because that goes in that targeting sequence of if they know where your SSH server is at, then they can start scanning it and attacking it because they have that long-term access to it. When you think about a scan and numeration, how they typically do a port scan, it's not fast. We're talking like three or four days to do a single port at a time, okay? With Tor, you saw in that config, I only have one port turned on. They find that port, what are they going to do then? They're going to try and throw an exploit, or they're going to try and do something against the box, right? Well, it's going to trip the failover man. Nobody's that good to get the password in three tries. I'm telling you because I know. Okay. So that failover man kicks off, it drops the node, it renames itself, they have to start the whole process over again. It's frustrating for them, it's easy money for you. This part talks specifically about bridging networks when you don't have control of the routes on the other side. And it's probably outside of what you guys got. We'll get an advanced port. This is where I talk about fail to ban by using the non-standard, non-routable IP addresses to hide your Tor services or host them. The key part about the non-routable is if you use a non-routable address to host that service, that means you can pipe all your real traffic through there then between these two gateways because if it's one of your clients behind you they're never going to go to that address in real life, right? So maybe I, instead of using a 188 address, like I use 188.0.0.1, and one of my clients happens to go to Comcast, and that's Comcast real IP, you're negating that problem from the get-go. 
<clears throat> this kind of goes into that discussion where I was talking about where this means you need to uniquely identify the service when it's being scanned. So basically, if I detect a scan on dot two, I know that that onion address was discovered. I then roll that onion address. And this is where we got into that SMS stuff from before. Um, we talked already about the IP services. When you have that GRE tall up, anything that is TCP IP based can flow across that GRE tall. Anything. Multicast, broadcast, unicast, doesn't matter. And the other thing to keep in mind too, that GRE tone is a layer two tone as far as that device is concerned. That means ARP traffic will go across that as well. So if you want to... I don't know what ARP traffic is. So let's say you have an Xbox, right? Okay. Your Xbox detects your Windows 10 machine, right? Okay. How does it do that? Right, you have a switch in your house, right? Yeah. Wi-Fi. Right? But they don't know each other's IP addresses, right? So at layer two, there's a broadcast address for that traffic. It's FFFFFFF, right? Everybody on that physical switch has to reply back to that FFF traffic. So when your Windows 10 machine sends out a discovery packet at layer two, every device in that broadcast domain has to reply back. That's how discovery happens at that point. You don't go to layer three until you leave the switch, or you leave that that subnet. You part this address resolution protocol. Right. So it, it goes from your MAC address, your physical address in the box, to an IP address. It's kind of like it's been like logical. Fifteen years since had my network in class, so <laughs> I'm a little rusty. Yeah, I mean, so where it, where it comes into play is right. So if it, how many of you guys have been on a on a network where you're in two different subnets, but the two machines can still talk to each other. Yeah, they're on them all the time. Right? Yeah. But there, there's no router involved. It's because you're in the same layer two domain. Oh, right. It sends out a broadcast, hey, who has this IP address? <laughs> well, you're in the same layer two, and they're like, well, I have that IP address. And the two start talking, even though they're not going through the gateway like they should be. Because they're in the same logical land. Yeah, it's generally viewed as a bad thing, but I mean, some applications, that's how they work, whatever. I mean, that's poor design, not not a problem for you or for I. You know what I mean? Um, the one thing you guys do have to really understand about Tor at the end, though, is this statement right here. All traffic that exits the last node in Tor is in its native form and subject to intercept. If you are browsing Tor or a website on Tor and you go to a standard HTTP website, the traffic leaving that exit node is not encrypted. That means that exit node has full visibility on that traffic. This is where application encryption becomes very important in security. Transport encryption is important, but it's really not that useful because if they can get into transport, they can start monitoring things. Okay, for abuse and advanced use. Tor is intended to protect user identities from the services that they browse. We are not doing that. If you read what I got there, um, this boils down to the fact that we control the exit node and we control the start node. We don't want the first mile to be aware of where we're going. I am trying to limit the visibility of that exit, my node, my private node, from being attacked. That's the intent here. So that's kind of the use case in this, that you don't trust the first mile. Does that make sense? Okay. Common errors, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, Can I ask you a question about the GRE stuff? You yeah. About, um, being able to have any kind of traffic over that, whether that's like, you know, like multicast or some kind of uh, phone communication or something, like anything. What yes. Is, what is the speed like? I mean, is it... It's, or even take, like, having a bandwidth to support Yeah, so what you'll end up with is you end up with about 400 milliseconds of latency, you end up with about 5% jitter. And I've pushed voice and video across for before. Okay. But here's the thing, you have to realize you're, you're bouncing, right? You're going through, if you're doing a hidden service, you're going to go through three nodes. Your latency will be about 400 milliseconds going through that. And we'll see that as I demonstrate here when I jump on this Pi. I'm already SSH into the server mm -hmm. elsewhere. It works. It's like being on a clunky satellite comms phone, but it works. 
for all intents and purposes it works. UDP traffic is still UDP traffic. If it makes it, makes it. If it doesn't, well, you don't hear me. So I realize this is pretty in-depth. I mean, this is a lot, right? Especially if you're kind of new to Linux or if you're new to networking. It, this is very... This would be more advanced than what most people would be used to seeing. I'll, I'll tell you right now, a lot of Linux sysadmins have a hard time understanding these concepts because it's not something they typically have to deal with. Being a data scientist, I don't know what you do. You've probably seen some things like this. Maybe, maybe not. Don't know. So, what are your guys' kind of questions and thoughts on what I've presented so far before we get into the actual application, just so I kind of get an idea where I got to go with you guys? Let me ask you a question about what I didn't quite get was you're talking about enumeration, and then right. if you get a field of band, like could you realize you were poor scanned, <coughs> then you said you would roll over to a new address. address. You're talking about rolling over to a new address on your uh, your local host address? Nope, on you. Okay. You're going to roll over to a new Tor address. By, like what, stop and restart your server, or how do you... I'll show you. Okay. So... We'll be on the box. How well can anybody see the screen up there? Can you see it fairly well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see if I can change mine. Change size. your font to make it larger. Oh, let's see. Change settings. Colors. Uh, can't make the under appearance. Appearance. Okay. Uh, font. Change. Ten point. Let's go to obnoxious. <laughs> Eighteen would be good. Let's try that. I can read that. I'm not sure about the people in the back. Okay. Just because I'm right up on it. So, right now I'm on the the Raspberry. It's denoted by the pirate node. So, yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah, that would help. Yeah, just flip the background. Let's, uh, let's see. Background. Pretty annoying. Actually, I can probably do it. Hmm. Uh, don't have it on here. Let's see. Oh, oh, change the background? Yeah. Anybody know the command off the top of their head for changing the. Uh... I'm sorry, I'm a black and white guy. It's not off the top of my head. <laughs> I like brown and yellow myself. That helps my, you know, it doesn't, it's harsh, you know, contrast, you know, beats my eyes. I've got to get something that's a little more, you know, easy to read, but not quite as, you know. I do white on black. My my command line on this machine is uh, green on black. And that works well. Really like I also use the like, yeah. 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 yeah
If you have two separate applications, you want to force traffic between the two, use SoCat or NetCat. Um, this is on the Raspberry right now. The Those are my colors. That's what I use on this. So you can see right there, see that SOX port, everybody, that 9050 SOX port? Remember we were talking earlier about the port that listens on? This is where you would change it in the config for this one, okay? You'd have to do it both for here and also in your SSH client country. Correct. Well. You'd have to change the SOCAP pipe or whatever. Yeah. If you want to get it working, just leave it alone. Okay? Don't mess. Take the defaults. Just take over. the defaults. The, the other thing, too, is when you get down in here, when we go into the uh, actual services running on the box, so this one's actually running hidden services right now. So this is on a cell phone. Do cell phones have public IP addresses? Does anybody know? Yes. They do not. Within the telecom no. system. They are netted behind a public IP address on the telco. Okay. So can you get to a cell phone from outside the telco traditionally? The IP address while it's on your Wi-Fi or the IP address while it's on the cell network? While it's on the cell network. Who do you have you as your telco? Okay. That is totally different than what any other telco is doing because they're running SIP as your voice carrier, whereas everybody else is still using uh, 724 U-Law codex. Okay. Google is one of the first where they're actually using a real IP network to haul all the traffic. And I ran this problem in Florida where I was trying to configure a phone to do some things. And I was trying to install another SIP client on the phone. And yes, Google is one of the few. If you go on a Verizon phone or AT&T or any other phone, and you look up at the IP address, it's going to be a 10-something. It's going to be hidden behind some bullcrap firewall. And a lot of times, they negate all the phone to phone traffic. You can't ping from one Verizon phone to another one even though you're behind the same map. They've isolated the traffic down that far. So everybody agrees that the Raspberry is on my phone. It's got a its what own file, private IP address. What file are we looking at here? I'm we are looking at the etc forward slash tor forward slash tor rc file. This is the config file for your tor service, okay? Right now I am hosting ports and basically what I have running for services. I've got the web server up and running, I've got SSH running, and I've got a SSL connection running, right, for a web service. Now, I don't think I actually have a web server installed on here, but there is SSH running. So what I can do is technically I can actually be outside the cell phone network, SSH back into that Raspberry Pi, and then have inside access to the telco. Does that make sense? So I've defeated the whole NAT process and firewall process in, in doing that. Um, so this is the, the typical file right here. Now everybody take note of the, the hidden services directory. Everybody see that? It's var lib tor hidden service. Okay. That's going to be critical in a second when we look at this. So when we go into that directory specifically, um, Serious man, you know. Um, those would be that the, is awesome. those would be the standard uh, permissions on that folder, though, wouldn't they? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you would that would be normal, but you couldn't get in. So look at. So I did an LSL on the on the folder I tried to get to. What do you notice about this folder? Does it say root anywhere on it? No. Right. I don't trust the Tor service. I'm not going to give it root access on my box. I'm not going to let it run as root. Okay? When you set these things up, put them in a nice user account that's nice and restricted. The only thing this has access to is its own files, okay? <laughs> you see what kind of permissions it has? Only user. Only itself. It's got execute on two folders. Everybody else, it's read write. Nobody else can even see it. So Ultimately, you're running these things on protected ports, though. So how do you, what are you doing to like 
see it as a sleep. Well, I mean, aren't you? Or are we at this kind of thing? Like 480, 443, those are below 1,000. So, right. those are particular ports reserved for root, aren't they? No. So the ports are not reserved for any one user. Okay. okay? The ports are whoever first comes first serve. Right. You come to those ports, and then that service, which does have permission to those files, accesses those files. Right. So like the Tor service, service is running as torrent anonymous as that user account on this Raspberry. That user account is very restricted. So if somebody were to zero day of service, okay, they get a pretty restrictive account that has access to really nothing, right? And hopefully, I'm smart enough to either turn off the Pi once a day or break that connection if they have any. The whole idea behind the tour is that you know you, you treat it as untrusted as much as possible. We were talking earlier about changing names on things. So you see that hidden services directory? Okay, so if we do a ls l on here, you're gonna see I have two things. I have a private key and I have a host name. The private key is what determines the host name. If you are running that fill the band script and you delete this private key. And you restart the service, so we'll do that right now. So we'll do a cat on the host name, okay? That is the onion address associated to this Raspberry Pi right now, okay? So if I do a this, so once this file gets popped. We'll do a verification that it's gone. Okay, file's gone. Now I'll do this. Everybody familiar with that command? It's just restarting the service. I restart the service. I'll do a new ls-l. You notice I have a new key generated. Okay. Now everybody see that host name starts with the QJ up there, right? Previously, new address. All we did was we deleted the private key, restarted the service. That's it. That's all that script that you have running in the background. If you want to pop it, you need to do. Delete that key, restart the service. That's it. You see, I went from the KJ or the QJ address down to this 16 address now, just by deleting the private key and restarting the service. Key note here, if you want to hold on to an address for some sentimental reason, back the key up. You will not get back to that key just by regenerating it. It's pseudo-random. You're not going to go back to it. So the way the enumeration, breaking of the enumeration cycle works is by having your script that's monitoring your ports delete that file and then restart the service. Then you, however you want to output the name of the host name to somewhere else, do that. You guys are links, guys. Figure it out. I mean, cat, however you want to get there, I don't really, it's up to you. If you want to post it to a web file encrypted in PGP, okay, have at it. Everybody clear on that? Makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to go back into my user account. <coughs> we'll well, go if home. you restart the service, if the part of the restarting the service generates the key. Right. Unless Unless, oh wait, unless the private key file is already there, then exactly. it would use it. Okay, so that's how you could preserve that old address. Right, so okay. Okay. if you back up the private key <laughs> and you have a new server you're standing up, but you want to keep the address, just copy the private key over. It's going to detect that there's a key in there, it's not going to create a new one. So when we go into this here, we'll go to the home directory real quick. All right. You're still on the Pi here. Yeah, I'm on the Pi. Yeah. So we'll do an ls-l here. So you can see I've got a config file in there, right? So we'll just do uh, There's that command I talked about where I'm basically telling my SSH session, hey, anytime you see an onion address, kick it over the sock, over the SOCAT, and pipe it over to the proxy. Okay? So that tells it to pipe to the proxy. Now the next thing I need to do is make sure that proxy is running. There it is, right? Everybody see the proxy running at that local address on 9050, right? So I know I got the proxies there. I know I got the command. 
I'll do some up arrowing. This is going to get me to the Tor server that's at my house. All right. You notice it's a standard SSH command. SSH will at some address with a port, right? Because you got to tell it what port to get. I'll hit enter. You got to wait for it. This is where the latency comes in. Anything that would keep you from choosing a, a higher port like 55,000 or something like that? You use 444 because it's like the textbook one that you see in any like offensive security class. Like 444, it just highlights it. Okay. So I enter my... Uh, that Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like less than 14 characters. I mean, I'm a little disappointed in myself. So, <laughs> I'm on this form box now, right? So mm -hmm. I'm on this box that's not here. Now, here's something you need to look at. There's going to be some delay. Right? So we'll do a netstat nat p, but... Matter of fact, let's do this. This is where I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. There's, there's a, there's an, I don't know if it's an add-on or something, but you can, maybe it's terminal session or some sort, I don't know if you can do it, but you can essentially cache the keys that you ran and you want and type, and it will seamlessly display it to you, but it will push that oh, over the network to the other box. I would tell you, don't do that on Tor. Really? You will be sadly surprised when that command doesn't execute because you think that key is on the other side. So, here's what's running on the far box. You can see I have a VNC session up on the far box, that 5902 there. Okay. Right. You can see that I have a bunch of, uh, you see how I'm connected to the 22, but I'm coming from my own port? That is the Tor service talking to port 22. That goes into that you defining that 127.0.2 is a different service. That way you see that. Because what you would see then at that point is you'd see a 127.0.0.2 colon 22 and then some bootback address. That then isolates it for you logically to that onion address because you should understand where you put your services out of both. Anyway, I put my clothes here in this drawer. You know? If you don't do that, you're going to run into a problem where you will not be able to segregate which service it came in on, right? Because if you're, you have all your traffic going to 22 and you're trying to isolate to one user, you're not going to be able to do it because you're not going to be able to break that traffic away at the, at the layer three level. That's why I tell you to segregate the services out and only give. So if you have five admins and you only want five people access, give them each their own loopback, isolate them into that loopback. That way you can tell who's talking too. All of a sudden, Johnny's stuff keeps coming up. Nobody else is coming up. Well, then you would have to go talk with Johnny about who he's maybe been talking to or maybe he had his machine looked at, right? Well, that's what I'm talking about when I say silo. Basically, you're controlling who has access to that knowledge. You know that Matt has access to the Q address. Christine has access to the J address, you know, and not Bart, the K address. And let's say Bart's machine is always scanning my box, so I know that it's coming from Bart. Not come from YouTube, right? And that's where you have to separate that enumeration from port scan. You have to think about logically when you do this stuff. So we're in the box. You can see that's going on. I've got some VNC stuff going on there. So we'll uh, take a look at the host name here. Now, who has a Tor browser up and running? Windows people, whoever, just fire up a Tor browser. I'm going to give you guys an address to go to, and it's going to be a web server that's actually running on this box. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll. Uh, let me get the stinking name off real quick. This is going to be Passwords just to make them long things you can memorize, or you use 
Like that one right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> it depends, right? So if you go with the four word thing that everybody talks about, so how did yeah, like how does brute forcing work against passwords? Yeah, anybody know? Yeah. Right, but if you know who you're targeting mm -hmm. and you know their hobbies and habits, yeah, social engineering master. I will tell you right now, like for passwords, mm -hmm. um, there's no one good answer, mm -hmm. right? I would tell you don't reuse them. That'd be step number one. Don't ever reuse them, ever. The typically when I look at a password and I attempt to attack a password, the first thing I will do is I will look at the user and I'll try and identify some personal traits about the user, whether or not they're a beginning user, novice user, intermediate, or advanced. Uh, advanced users tend to think they're getting away with stuff and use simple passwords. Or reuse them because there are admins on so many boxes, right? Yeah. Um, as far as passwords go, if you have like a four-word acronym or something that you're used to using, throw random bits in on the end that you can memorize. So if you like horse, elephant, tiger, cat, throw some special characters in there that you understand that makes sense to you, you know, and change it up and do that. That's gonna slow the GPU farm down a lot. But the key is to have enough length in there. Right, because that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with A6 and GPU farms, right? So a GPU against a WPA password, like a Titan X can do like 500,000 attempts a second. So that's one. So imagine I have like 30 of them. You're gonna exhaust like a nine character key space in like 15 minutes. I mean, math for, you know, tries versus math, you know, I mean, it's also incredibly dependent upon who you are as a person. Matt Raymond from Frederick, Maryland is not going to get a massive GPU ASICs farm trying to crack your... Really? <laughs> Think about that, though. Yeah. How many kids around here right now are mining ASICs? Okay. okay, there's a big difference between a kid mining Ethereum trying to get into his no, system. No, there's not. How fast are those processors are you using? I, I get what you're saying. But there's, there's also a little bit of paranoia in that, that, okay, if Matt just is, has a password that has five words in it, uh, No, you're not, not going to get that, in. but where, where you get into the weirdness, right, is what does Matt do? Well, that's, again, that's what I'm saying. It's dependent upon who he is as a person. Right. Matt Lehman, the, the guy that works for Storybird, is not going to have China trying to crack his stuff. You, you wouldn't think that, but here's here's where, you know why I got in the tour initially for SSH stuff? I'll, I'll share a story with you guys. I was hosting an SSH server at my house because I needed to admin some stuff. I was running a process where I needed to check in on it periodically, right? And I'm paranoid just because I'm a security guy. So I'm checking my logs and I see that every day, within two hours of that box being up, I'm getting hit by China. Okay, my box doesn't have a domain name associated to it. It's a Comcast IP address. Or somebody routing it, through China. To, to, it's, yeah. it's more more than likely some sort of... It's an automated bot network that's in yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. But the service is only up for two hours and it starts getting the traffic. 30 minutes on a regular basis. The, the, the thing there is that they're trying known passwords that are, that are averagely used, they're not doing the... Right, but they tasks. also attack at that point that there's an SSH server sitting there. You can fingerprint an SSH server based on its response. Right. They're still going to do root, root, admin, admin. Absolutely. Those things. They're not doing, they're not doing a brute force. But the point I'm getting at is that the noise characters. is such a level now that him working for an IT company, they might not be after that. They might want to look at one of his clients. Mm -hmm. When you enumerate something, when you're looking at a network to attack, I don't go after the corporate headquarters. I go after the VPN user that's going to click on the email I send them. Yeah. Because if I can get on his machine where the VPN is running, I'm already in. Yeah. I don't have to worry about the $30,000 firewall that you build. I'll just jump on your box. Hey, Matt, here's some cat pics. <laughs> you know? Who the cat pics? Clicks on a cat pick, yeah. you know, and he gets yeah, it. <laughs> that's, that's still not answering the, the, the password question. Um, 
So the password question comes down to this, right? So what is it you're trying to protect with the password, right? You're trying to protect physical access to the machine, typically, right? And prevent people from running remote processes as you on that machine. That's where the password really comes in hand, is prevention of remote process being executed on the machine, right? Because I'll be honest with you, physical access to the box, nobody's running BitLocker here on Linux, I can tell you that right now. I can just tell by the how quick everybody logged in. I don't need to have your password to get in your box. I'll just pull the hard drive out and plug it in mine and look at the partition. And then I'll pull your shadow file and run that against the GPU farm. That's the thing, it's enumeration, right? The whole point is understanding what it is you're trying to protect. In this particular case, we're trying to protect SSH, right? The way SSH gets targeted is they look at the IP address. So we deal with that by, well, we'll change the IP address a whole bunch of times. You know, the passwords, yeah, they're, they're relevant, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't have, like, the letter A for my password. And you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I was going to tell you guys, so back where we're starting at, we want to look at the web server that's run on this box, so we'll... No, it's so. This is me running off a cell network which adds 30 milliseconds, going through a Tor network which adds like 380 milliseconds. And you can see it's it's usable. You know, I mean, it's not like it's painful. Um, you can see here I had two different keys, right? So I have an old key and a new key, right? Um, if I change the extension, it changes the address. So in this particular case, we'll cat the host name. So if you wanted to use the old key, you just rename, flip, rename the files yeah. or something like that. If you guys go to a Tor browser right now on port 80. That's a letter L, it starts with a letter L. Yeah, it'll be a L O Y. They're all 16 characters and painful, I apologize. L Y 7 U O. Yep. 7 U O 7, again. Um, T D V T D V M U G R D R U G R D R dot onion. Okay, you should get a web server, right? Okay. So click on any one of the if you get up or not. I got a skull with sword cross. Go to user sword. pages. Go to file share. Okay. All right, so I've got HTTPS run on here with my own root CA, so it's probably going to give you guys some headache, but just accept the cert. No, it's not going to do this crazy, I promise. Who wants username or email and password? Right, so anybody recognize this web page? Uh, own cloud? Oh, or is yeah. whatever came after oh. own cloud. Yeah. So this is yeah, yeah, this is like version 8. And this is how long it's been since I've opened this server. Oh, this is your local instance of it? Right? Yeah, it's a local okay. instance of own cloud, nothing, nothing fancy. Um, okay, no, that's fine. I mean, you're, you're proving Tor. I mean, it's not fair. Right, so this is all through Tor. So I've yeah. got a file share on Tor. What we'll do is I'll log in real quick, create an account, and you guys can all log in and dump stuff to it. Um, oh, you can cool. see how bad or good the upload speeds are. So let me okay, uh, sure. Jump on the box real quick. And you could put, you know, if, if the IP address is there, you just bookmark it and you don't have to remember that long name. Again. Yeah. You just click on, you know, make it a. So keep in mind, we haven't even gotten to the point where we're doing the IP based stuff yet. So mm. when you do the, the GRE tunnel, that's when things get really interesting. Because then, if you're GRE in your home network and you want to look at your home router, just type in the IP address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's un it doesn't unpack until it comes out the exit node at the other end, and then all that higher layer stuff can kick in. Your browser doesn't even care or know about that. So your browser is literally thinking it's on the home network at that point, because the GRE tunnel is going to bridge the two. It's going to be like, oh, I'm on house network. Okay, I'm going to, what's the wife doing on the internet? So when I went to your wiki, I got a connection. It's not 
That's because there's HTTPS running on the server, and you do not have my root CA. Wiki. Oh, Wiki. Let me see. Wiki. 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 Because you're not in the, the um, cert list of... Uh, it's okay. He's, he's not working for China and trying to <laughs> super catch all of your stuff. <laughs> Confirm security exception. <laughs> well, think about it. this too, right? So <laughs> how many people do you know, how many root CAs is there for domain name addresses? Oh. There isn't any. Yeah, so that defeats the purpose <clears throat> to a certain extent. So this was something that we set up just proof of concept, one of the guys wanted to see it, whatever. Um, so let me log into mm. there and I'll just create a keylog account and you guys can all jump into it. I like that you have the comp file uh, contents up there, like sip.conf and some of the things. Oh, now it's being pulled down my side. I love it. Hmm. That's a lot. So, so you use your personal browsing? Like, how do you find yourself using this service? So, Tor, I only use for connecting to servers I need to get in. I don't actually browse on it because I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not concerned about it. Um, I'm here in the United States. Uh, you know, the government's not going to pull me on my bed at midnight. Unless I'm going into work, I guess. Um, so, I mean, in countries like ours, you know, in places where it's very, you know, open, I wouldn't bother with using it. I mean, it's not something I need to use. If you're going into Africa or Russia or a country where it's very restrictive on freedom of speech and, and things that, like, civil freedoms, uh, yeah, I would be using this all day, every day. But like you so were saying, you for dissident safety, they would have other security measures. That it, it's a whole combination of water right? Tight, so, you know. getting out, all right, so, when you think about Tor, right, it's still, you can still see Tor natively on, on, on Wireshark, right? So there's a feature you can add on that allows to bypass the packet inspection to me. Basically what they do is it's something called the main fronting. And what happens is, is that your Tor traffic is then rerouted through, actually it's hosted on AWS and other. The idea is, is that all your traffic goes through this process called Meek and it transforms all the traffic into real HTTP requests and pulls. Like it all looks like that going across, like you're calling JPEGs. And it goes to a Meek server on AWS. They have to block all of Amazon services in order to kill that connection. And when they monitor it, it looks like you're on Amazon shopping. Right? So that will bypass deep packet inspection and everything else involved with uh, defeating Tor, right? How it, do you spell it? Meek. M-E-E-K. M-E-E-K. And it was specifically designed for situations in countries that do not allow Tor. Like they know, they get the Tor entry node list, right, and they block them all. So you use me. And that's how you bypass it at that point. So I mean, here in the States, do I use it? No, because I don't need to. I'm not, I'm not doing anything I need to worry about where my browsing habits are as such. The only time I use something like this, if I'm going to connect to my house network or something like that, I'm at a hotel, I'm going to use this. Because the hotel does not need to know where my IP space is. The hotel does not need to see that. And plus, you don't know who's in the hotel with you. When you go to the airport and you're hanging out at the airport and you see all the free Wi-Fi wi wi hotspots. Or pineapples or something. You think that's a coincidence? <laughs> I mean, that's the best place to go commit robbery. Think about it. It's a high transit population. You have approximately four hours to act on any credit card information that you gather. Right? During mm -hmm. flight. Go shopping. And they're all putting in their credit card information to get on the Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll do an IPA. Um, that'll tell you like the IP addresses I'm currently running on this Tor box. And you're going to see that a okay. bunch of network cards, but none of them are public IP addresses, right? So this is behind a NAT, behind a firewall, behind another NAT, behind another firewall. 
And the service reaches out through all that and connects to its first peer and basically establishes that reverse tunnel back in. So when you're on the website browsing, what happens is, is that the The rendezvous point that your server is connected to is actually advertising on your behalf. Apparently, my tour circuit's super slow right now because I'm probably routing to like sign. Up. I don't know. Yeah. The other thing to think about too is when you're when you're using tour, and this is something to think about. The exit nodes, there is a couple of large exit nodes that are controlled by government entities. How about China? <laughs> Okay, so that's why I don't necessarily use Tor for browsing out onto the web. I have access to do that. And the other thing too is if I control the exit node, they're not going to see my traffic going out my exit node. Because it's going out my Comcast router at my house, right? I don't care if Comcast sees me looking at cat pics all day, like, oh, those looking at another kitten pic, whatever, right? What I do care about is trying to mine my metadata off my user agent strings and the cookies and stuff and me going to my bank or wherever else. That bothers me. The SSH tunnel that I'm using in this protects me from four. All my traffic is going through SSH, right? Once I have that GRE tunnel built, so Tor can no longer see my traffic that I'm putting out. So you see, I get these degrees of separation and protection in there. So that's the defensive depth aspect of the network. Yeah. Anybody have a password that they want to do on? Do you just use password? <laughs> That's on like every one of those. Force battery. Force battery. What was that? Staple? Staple. Stable like a horse yeah. stable okay. or staple like a thing that connects pick the paper together. Sorry, it is the correct paper. horse battery staple. Yeah. All right, so there's a key log account. You guys should be able to log into it now. <laughs> um, it is horse battery staple for the password that will probably not last through the weekend. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, is definitely, a that definitely violates like every ounce of my, you know, <laughs> horse. <laughs> for, for those wondering, if you go to xkcd slash 936, that is where you can find out how to spell that password. Um, and it will also explain the, uh, the reasons behind that. Okay, go where? xkcd. Oh, XK oh okay, xkcd. So, oh my god, the safe home for all your data. Connect your desktop oh, apps to yeah. own phone. <laughs> They let you in. Yeah, I, that's what uh, it says. Uh, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm actually looking at documents, uh, photos. Uh, can I download your cat pictures? <laughs> There's nothing in that. There shouldn't be any in that particular user account. Paris squirrel. Uh, got a squirrel picture. San Francisco. I mean, if you want the squirrel picture, by all means. I mean, I don't. <laughs> This is the default install, so I mean, if there's a small oh, picture in there, that's, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm viewing the squirrel. <laughs> that's a pretty sassy squirrel. But, so you can see in this particular instance, so if a person was trying to share files with a journalist on own cloud over Tor, you see how everybody's logged in on the same account at this point, right? Oh, yeah. There's no personal identification really going back and forth. Except for your server logs. Right. Yeah. So if I put this on AWS, right, and then I know that the end of that particular drop between the journalist and the, the person in that restricted country, I just delete the server. So you need a server admin to help cooperate to provide the... Um, well, your server admin is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-
There's like ten of us in here. Yeah. The point is that there's a lot of ways to get a rock to get this type of service up and running. Right? So this is Tor basic hidden service usage. The the SOCAP piece. Um, kind of go into that for a quick second. That's where you actually are going to bridge. How many of you guys have, are aware that you can port forward on SSH? Has anybody done that? Okay. What can you port forward on SSH? Oh, I've VMC'd over right. SSH. I mean, right. So, we'll fire up, let's see, this is the box it's going on. Yeah, Let me switch out browsers real quick. No, hold on, you're good. I'm just going to plug in on this one. Yeah, okay, sure. All right, so this machine should be pre-configured for. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but this is a Windows box, right, that I'm about to connect to a Tor server. The, there's been a change, though, in the way it's configured. In this particular session, you're going to see I have some tunnels set up, specifically 5901. Uh, Send me that for you. Oops, sorry, folks. All right, so and we'll see in a second. We'll see if the VNC is mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I'll open it. Now you'll notice one thing is not going to work because I don't have what up and running. Anybody, this is the basic troubleshooting process for users. You don't have a Tor client running on your Windows machine. I don't have internet either, right? Oh, so let's start off where everybody starts off at. I gotta join some internet. Okay. All right, connected. Okay, great. I don't have a Sox proxy. Here's a Tor browser. Okay, we'll fire that off. Midnight is what? It's a time. No. But <laughs> <laughs> is that your phone running an AP or? Yeah, it's my phone running the AP. Okay. I'm trying. It might not be running because you see. It's supposed to have keys. I love to keep, give the keys to bad items. For? For the pull it what? No, I don't have a, there's not a key involved in this one. Okay. This is a straight up password on this one. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Um, I'm not really a fan of keys. But for SSH? Not particularly. Okay. Automated logins, not so much. Well, not that it'd be automated, it's just that you would have to enter, you have an additional layer of, you know, user interface where you have to have your private key on the machine, you have to put your password in for your private key, it just adds that. You know. Yeah, I'm tell, not aware what it is, but yeah, if I get right, access no. to your machine and I pull all your keys out, I then have access to all your other stuff. You have that access, and you, 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 would, you would edit the uh, sshd underscore config and, and take the requirement for the sshd out of there, restart the server, and yeah, so have fun. SSH keys, I, I would say this about SSH keys. You are automating, if you don't have a password associated with using that key, you're probably in the wrong. Oh, you've got to have a password associated with the key. That's the point. You have to have the password in it and the private key to be able to get in. I understand that. But what yeah. I'm saying is a lot of times users will have a have a, a client cert and they will forego the... Oh, no, 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 no. I used to do that. I'm just <laughs> letting you know that... Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it's looking for really information. So what's it doing? Populating its Sometimes own... Sometimes it's the only way to go for some, like... Code and stuff Absolutely. And in oh, situations yeah. like that, yeah, that's, that's that goes into the resource case. requirement. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good so there's a, there's a place for it, but I understand the point that it is better to have a password on the computer. Excuse me. All right. Okay, so we'll load that. You'll notice that's the same address that I gave you guys for the website. It'll take a second to come up. It's going to say log in as.
as that's going on, the VNC server is already running. So if I do a, I, sorry if the screen is small on this one, but we'll see if it's up and listening right now. It's on 5902, so I'll change that real quick in the config. So you can do this on the fly with uh, Putty and with regular SSH. If I had a VNC client and I pointed it to port 5902 on that server, I would get a, um, a desktop of some sort? Yes, but you'd have to have the... You'd need a VNC client on your machine. You need a VNC client, but you also need to be port forwarding 5902 through SSH in order to do it. So that's there. That should have the tunnel up. We'll uh, bring up Tiger VNC. Mm -hmm. And you're already doing the port forwarding. Yeah, that. the port forwarding I just activated. So you notice yeah. I'll, I'll pop it off. You notice it's going to go to the local connector. Now, if everything's behaving like it should be, it should connect. And there it is. So this is an example of using a service over Tor. This VNC session is riding over SSH over Tor. And that Pi is serving that, or is that your home server? No, this is on the Dell 610 at the house. So you can see that, you know, it's there. It's doing its thing. It's not the best interface. I'm going to just do a tour. Did it drop? Yeah, connection dropped. If the connection drops, you got to fire it off again. And remember, all these things are relying on SSH running. So this is fairly typical of what you'll see. Now, if you give it a sudo TTY line, has anybody done that on SSH before? It kind of like backgrounds the SSH session for you, but keeps the tunnels up. You can do that as well. So any standard SSH switch that you're used to using will work across this. It can be very, cell gets a little finicky with SSH in general. Let's see here. What would be the way to do this? I guess we could do this tiger app. Tiger didn't see it, so you're not behaving today. If it doesn't come up, we'll move on. What you'll typically see, though, is that the SSH session will stay very stable. Your GRE tone will do pretty stable, too. Anything that's UDP mm -hmm. and you're pushing it over tour, hit and miss. Okay? So is that you're able to do UDP over GRE? Mm -hmm. okay. And through SSH. So if you only have one service you want to run that's UDP, just forward the port over okay. to SSH. You don't have to go full Monty with the GRE tunnel. If you're, if you're only limited to one service, just do a port forward to that SSH session and leave it as is. Don't get wrapped around the axle that you need the whole SOCAT tunnel. The SOCAT tunnel comes into hand is if you want to bridge two routers together, like you've got a Cisco device on one end and another one on the other end, mm -hmm. and you want to, for some reason, keep them unaware of where the other one's actually at, you would do this, and it would bridge over it. 
that pretty much concludes what I have for what you, what's going on. Where are the questions, feedback, I guess? I know it's a lot. It's audience dependent. So I guess one question I had was, I remember running tour a long time ago, but being a little uncomfortable with it because there was the, you're hosting content sometimes for pieces of encrypted content, so. That's tour, torrents. No, no, like uh, with Onion Rally, uh, isn't there, maybe, yeah, I guess it could be wrong. Isn't there like, when you're running a tour node, you're passing traffic for other, you are passing traffic for other ones, but you have to keep in mind that the way the Tor encryption works is that the originating node is going to encrypt it six times. There will be six SSL encrypted headers on that packet if you're using a standard Tor exit. Okay, For Tor hidden services, it will be three. So when that hits you, you will be somewhere in that SSL encryption. right? You will not have any visibility as to what that data is that data will not be able to affect your machine in any way because it is SSL traffic. If it affects the Tor node in some way, like somehow compromises the Tor service, it would kill the service and would take you out of the network. But are you at, at any risk of carrying traffic for like bad actors? Absolutely. Okay. But that goes into the preschool theory. Um, let me bust back on this one. We'll actually look at that slide a little bit. If you're in a room full of noisy people, right? and you're trying to talk, what does it matter who's in the room talking? If I'm in a restaurant with mobsters, does that make me a mobster? I, I understand what you're saying there. The issue is uh, the, from a, from a, from a at least American uh, investigative approach. In the, the innocent until proven guilty. I understand that. However, while you are innocent until proven guilty, if you are in a room full of mobsters eating lunch, mm -hmm. you are now considered a mobster. I know you are innocent until proven guilty, but you are you have they now have probable cause because you are in a room full of mobsters just just eating lunch. But because you're there, mm -hmm. they now can potentially consider you Do you use Skype? Okay, who else in the room uses Skype? There's, there's, okay. a big, there's a big difference between. No, nope. listen to what I'm about to say. Okay. Who in here has analyzed the traffic for Skype? Did you know that it routes through multiple countries before it gets to you? Do you know that there's failover nodes in Russia, China, Eastern Europe, and all these other places? That's encrypted, that the encryption is very hard to break? Does that make you guilty? There's, there's a so, so if you're hosting an exit right? Right. And you know that you're doing zero. Right. And some, can someone else, so basically you're, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have any way of saying I'm the only person doing this exit code, right? So, so try Actually you do. Okay. Then yeah, we log in with an SSH session to build that exit node. <clears throat> okay. Because that, that's, I think, the, the point that you're getting at, is that if, you, if you're creating your own exit nodes for the, for the tour service, right. You don't, <clears throat> and they're, excuse me, I'm kind of sick. If you're on your own network and someone, like, let's say, let, let's go for the, the default bad scenario for you know, this kind of stuff. If someone's going to back page or, or hosting CP or doing something like that, you don't necessarily want that network traffic on your system at all, even if it's in your DMZ. Here's the thing you got to realize. So if we're, if we're negating that, then that's fine. Yeah, if you're hosting a Tor service, a hidden service, right? Right. That traffic has to talk to the service application that you're running. SSH does not proxy. It doesn't. Right? SSH requires intentional user authentication. Right? If I build an SSH tunnel from my computer to my home network, right, and I then exit my internet traffic out of my home network that I pay for, Nobody's putting child porn through that. No, not possible. Not through that, but through the act of, correct me if I'm wrong, if the, the question was, the act of running the tour server that allows that's your, that's allows, uh, allows other right. folks to have their traffic routed through your nodes. So not let's look at that real quick. Not through tunnel, but through the fact that you're running tour. So let's take a look at something real quick. 
And that's, that's what I was getting Anybody at. see that, that line right there where it says this section is just for relays? What's a relay? That's the uh, balancing of the traffic from that to me to, to him, right? Right. You have to sign up to be a relay. Okay. Oh. Uh, so you can be on the network and not be carrying traffic for other. And it's actually highly recommended that you do not browse and be a relay at the same time. Mm -hmm. That is frowned upon. So who does accept? I mean, obviously some people choose to be a relay who they just not care about going in for all cases, or how do they protect themselves from the legal liability? Of the well, the legal liability goes in encrypted <laughs> communications, right? So, here's the legal liability, right? So, if the encrypted communication, let me ask you this is a telco liable for child pornography traversing their networks? Right, common carrier, right? Common carrier. So, so, correct. They are not, however, you are not a telco. If a telco brought, transmits child pornography from one person to another, they are legally not liable. Right, because but you have to prove that I know that I'm transmitting child pornography. Correct. However, that's not going to stop the FBI from arresting you and putting you in jail while they... There's never been a case of that happening in the United States. I can tell you for fact. Okay. So there's a strong difference between you coming in my house and finding stacks of CDs of child pornography versus me being a poor relay operator. Okay. Let's think about this. Let's think about the number of assets they put against Silk Road. Right? It took them six months to bust Silk Road and it came down to a Firefox zero day. Right? I, I agree. Right? And then legally, did anybody get charged for carrying that black, the Silk Road, the, the rendezvous point operators, the guys running relays? Did any of those guys get charged? Not one. I agree with what you're saying. My issue is why open yourself up to that and uh, other technologies? Essentially Name one. Uh, you run a VPN service. Okay, now I attack your endpoint with a zero day against your Cisco router. I'm not running Cisco router. Okay, now you're running Unix, even better. You're running excellent for some embedded firmware that hasn't been updated in six months. Perfect. That's, I mean, now we're getting into some, some high level stuff. No, you're not. Go ahead and look on a CVE right now and look for any embedded firmware, and you're going to find that there's millions of CVEs for that. Because every node in between you and them has to process the packet the first node takes to hit. When you think about a zero day against Tor, right? In order to process that zero day on the stack, it has to be where? In the SSL header, right? Technically, yes. You are not the first hop. When you want to attack a Tor service, you find the location, and then you enumerate the service. You can still enumerate my web server. That's still possible, right? You fire up a Kali instance, you set up a SOX proxy, you point your Nikito or whatever it is you're going to use against the web server, and you point it at 9050 and you point it at that onion address and you enumerate like you would a standard web server. The only thing that's going to protect me is if I'm running some sort of tripwire to detect that type of scan going on. And then mitigate the same way I would mitigate running a standard web server like you would anywhere else, you know, in the IT community. Tor does not absolve you of running security scans and logging and these other things. Tor simply changes your location in a rapid manner in order to hinder enumeration. It's not going to stop it altogether. The idea that you somehow become responsible for traffic that is six times encrypted and that there's no logs of whether or not the traffic actually went through your node or not, it's not reasonable. There's no log anywhere telling me that if she sends me a packet and it went to you and that packet had a credit card number in it, that circuit ID is blown. That circuit ID that you create 
is unique to that instance and is destroyed and is no longer relevant after that. It's not like when you're dealing with like Bitcoin where there's a transaction log dealing with that after the fact. The whole idea that the FBI is going to kick your door down for running a Tor relay, that could happen. Depends on what you're hosting. Right? If you're hosting content and you're responsible for content that is destructive in nature or abusive to children, I got no love for you. That's hosting fun. is different from relay, I think. Yeah, different. and that's what I'm getting at. I mean, if you're if somebody is into doing that, I mean, that's a whole different ball. That's a whole different ball game, right? But acting as a Tor relay, you're one. You're relaying encrypted traffic, right? The Tor circuit IDs are torn down every session. But if you guys open up your Tor browser, you notice you have the option to select a new circuit ID. That intercepts. That changes all the points you jump to at that point. The, the thing that I don't want people to get this idea that when we get a fear built up to a technology based on a potential legal action, you are hindering your ability to be reflexive against a hacker. Because guess what? A hacker doesn't care. They don't. It's just the way it is. Um, and I guess child porn is often the argument that we encourage any distributor. Right. Any, any sort of transport that uses some sort of distribution and federation is going to, uh, some politicians are going to say, well, what about people? It's like, it's, it's, it's like the, you know, Right, like the that's, take, that's, that's taking the extreme, Hitler, right? you know, and this yeah. is this is the thing that we're doing here. You're taking an extreme <laughs> event, right? So let's take kitty porn out of it. Now what? So, so my argument there is, uh, torrents are distributed. You, through the act of having a torrent file and, and syncing that, that information that's in that torrent file, allow you to then be a part of that network and distribute that specific file. Let's say it's a Linux ISO. You are inherently, through torrent, allowing yourself to be a part of that. Whereas with Tor, if you are a relay, you are through the act of being a relay, allowing yourself to be a part of transmitting you know, control, control the data that shows up. You have no but BitTorrent, you are hosting part, parts of stuff. Right, but you yeah. are only hosting the parts that you actively take a part in. Right, but, but the security of Tor is in the obscurity. You have to look at that. Security so, through obscurity. So what you're looking at, what you got to look at is like this, right? So you're concerned about the contents. You're concerned about doing content filtering on a system designed not to do content filtering. Right. I understand that. Right. That's, That's an oxymoron in itself. But I, I'm saying that specifically because of the content that is transmitted over Tor, that I'm not able to uh, morally subscribe to. What kind of content is trying to transmit over Tor? Anything that, that I may not be moral, morally happy to, to have. Right. Problems. Terrorist cell communication. Absolutely. But then if we're going to go that distance, you should yeah. turn off your computer because the internet transmits that communication. However, it's not being transmitted through my computer. Right. And then just in this case, this section is just for relays. I understand that. As a relay, I'm turning my computer into a relay that is subscribing to the possibility but, of terrorism. But the relay is not there. Can you live with being I agnostic is really what the issue is. I understand. I didn't realize yeah. in, until this was shown that we had the capability of not being that. Okay. that. That changes. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of analogous to SSH client and server in a way, I guess. And I guess you could draw that the, parallel. See, I mean, if earlier yeah. you mentioned that, that there's a soon to be a, a tour feature that will allow you to simply create private tour networks. <laughs> Didn't we just do that in a way? You had your own exit node? Yeah. But he was still part of the so Tor network. Oh, yeah, he tra here's transitioned verbatim off the Tor website. Yeah. The Tor network relies on volunteers to donate bandwidth. Right. The I more people run relays, the faster the Tor network will be. My my initial understanding, which has now changed, was the act of being part of Tor made you a relay. Since you can opt out of being a relay, that does change things. Yeah. And earlier you did mention that there, maybe I misheard you, that there is soon to be a feature that would allow you to create your own private Tor networks? No, so what it does is, so with hidden descriptors, like the hidden service, you have to contact a rendezvous point to advertise that out, right? Mm -hmm. 
when the new feature comes out, the rendezvous points no longer get the real onion address. They get an encrypted onion address, right? That only your cert can unlock. So if I have a, a, a slave cert, right? Say I have a root CA and I have a client cert, right? Only my client cert can unlock that onion address, further obscuring that onion address. So then, like, I feel for you if you're trying to break some onion addresses at that point. I mean, like, could you, could you essentially brute force uh, an onion ID router and just, uh, well, I mean, and, and just I guess if you could break RSA 224. No, I mean, like the, 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 the addresses are a, a, a string of characters. So right, but do you know how to generate it? No. There are 80 bit hash of an EDCH. Basically, it's an elliptical curve. But you could. That's a map. Right, so you start, you start extracting the problem is you're not going to get back to the next state. You're going to get other possible onion addresses along that. Right. Yeah. So and the thing is, they're not unique to a service, right? So right. like, like will.com does not have a onion address tied to my name. Like it's obscure. You have to figure it out. So uh, with your um, the the third the, the sorry the text messaging of the actual onion address, like when when the failure that happens. Yep. Um, is there anything stopping you from just when you start your service to actually generate a whole bunch of key files and uh, use those as basically like a one-time use path? Nope. Okay. And that's actually so. In the land of security, there's a couple things you can do, right? So there's ways to defeat the hidden descriptor stuff too that you're talking about. So if you look at hidden descriptors, you can kind of correlate when they're created, right? So if you correlate that five hidden descriptors were all created on the same day, you can kind of assume that that's the same server, right? So if you spread all that out over a pseudo-random period and then hold on to those keys, you could then gain more security by deleting the key and inserting a new one, right? Because then they're going to look at the hidden descriptors field and see if there's a new onion address generated to correlate to when that machine dropped. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can do what you're talking about. So you, you can pre-gen all of your onion addresses and then distribute them. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And then whatever just you know distribution model that you have deemed as being secure is what you would use. Right. Yeah, yeah, the idea, guys. I mean, just four is really nothing more than a transport. Right? That's all it is. I think what I will do in the future is, as I mentioned earlier, is bring my bamboo pad with me so that, you know, a, a presenter can draw things and it show up on the screen here. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't, we can't erase what they have on their whiteboard uh, so we can, uh, I mean, you They'd physically mad. <laughs> you physically could, but I don't want to. <laughs> no, I, I will make a point to bring the bamboo pad so that you know anyone can draw if they need to. Forget uh, that circuit diagram. That's from the last meetup, so it's not like they actually Is that from the last meetup? Yeah, because we couldn't get on the Wi-Fi, so uh, oh. the, the Microsoft guy said, "Hey, you can use my corporate." Oh, for fun. Have fun. Oh, awesome. Okay. See, now if you're pulling some stuff over that, that might get him in trouble. <laughs> that, that might, yeah, that could see. He opted in as a relay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, but, but his company's paying for it. You know, that's, that's where it gets a little. <laughs> They're can't opt too, in as a relay. Like, I'm going to opt in as a relay, but. You're opting in your company's network as a relay. It does, that's generally frowned upon. You know, people go like, well, I don't know if that can fly. I, I realize, guys, that this is a lot to take in, especially if you don't have like a strong networking background. Um, the subject matter is... The subject matter is important because we are getting to a point where you are correct. The, the, the attackers have no morals. And will do what it takes to get your systems, whether or not you're Matt Lehman, who right. has absolutely no 
no, no thing that anybody would actually care about. Well, he's so secure, he doesn't even show up the laptop. I mean, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. Or, 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 <laughs> Go to DEF CON with a notepad. Like, yeah. the, the, Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Bring me here. Uh, we, have, we all have multiple attack vectors against us already with the amount of data that's been put out against us. That at this point, you should, if you want to be smart, you should be looking at things like this to protect when you are right. on the internet. The thing is, though, so when we think about data on the internet, I don't know if anybody's a data miner here, right? This statement would also be true as you determine what the data is. If you feed the bad, feed the machine bad data, you know, you win. Something to think about. I mean, ho hopefully some of you guys aren't putting your real birthday on Facebook. I was born January 1st on every single website I've ever been. 1970. That's like. 81's really. See if their Unix time code is right. What's your epic time there? I picked 1981 just so I can remember that it's not the actual. In January 1st, 1970, would be cool. Yes, normally this subject, like when I give this brief like this to folks, it's usually like an eight hour session. Of it's, it's a lot to cover two hours. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Yeah, yeah thanks for having me. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Yeah.